I, I did not mean to throw you under the bus. <laughs> um, but, but what came up yesterday was um, uh, prompted by uh, an observation of mine in the temporal um, proposal about the vulnerability of an internal interface using uh, iteration as a consumption. He proposed uh, finding a way to lock down array.prototype symbol.iterator property in order to make iteration consumption safe from uh, interference at a distance. And um, so, 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 let, let me ask: What, what when you say talk about safety and vulnerability? Uh, are you looking at a hard context? At a what context? Or are you just talking about in a in a, in a SES context, in a hard, hardened JavaScript context, or are you just talking about normal JavaScript? Normal JavaScript. Uh, actually, Cess, Cess does protect against this. So the issue is that um, in in a normal JavaScript context, any code can overwrite uh, the array prototype symbol.iterator property. And when they do so, anything that uses uh, iteration protocol to consume from an array is going, to, is going to use your override rather than actually uh, iterating the array elements reliably. Okay, so what I don't understand about this is if we're not if we're talking about just normal JavaScript, you've got pervasive vulnerability of everything to everything anyway. So what's the threat model where addressing this particular vulnerability while leaving everything else in a state of everything vulnerable to everything? Uh, what's what's the threat model such that it makes sense to just address this by itself? Uh, the one that I raised in temporal is is consumption of built-in data by a built-in operation. So it, it's it's an injection point. I think. So I uh, I'm sharing the screen right now, and this is the argument that came up. Like uh, the example is just a four uh, iteration, four off iteration of a simple array, um, and that is just purely using purely syntax. Uh, pretty much, and that it, it it would be vulnerable to somebody overriding the array prototype symbol iterator. Uh, so I, I think the the level the distinction here is the level of surprise, I would guess. So I just I'm struggling to find coherence here. Um, the there is plenty of places where. Uh, in normal unprotected JavaScript, uh, things depend on um, operations that uh, can be, you know, that that JavaScript code can mutate, and uh, in so doing, introduce arbitrary, you know, not arbitrary, but tremendous number of surprises. The in general, the defense that the spec has engaged in with regard to those things is to decide to use the internal function rather than the current value of the property um, uh, for some things. Like, for example, await does not use the current value of promise prototype then, it uses the internal then method. Uh, there's lots of, lots of things like that where you just resort to internal methods. But if you're polymorphic, um, where there's not a single internal function, but rather um, a operation that depends on the receiver, then for normal JavaScript, it's, I would say, part of the intended semantics of the language that it depends on the receiver and what the receiver is depends on how the environment has been mutated. I mean, how the receiver behaves depends on how the environment has been mutated. Yeah, and uh, and 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 I okay. believe uh, we should in special case things like that. And if you want a reliable execution environment, uh, the solution we've been advocating is to freeze the uh, intrinsics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know we've done all of this work to 
to provide a coherent, defensible JavaScript system. And I think making base JavaScript more complicated in ways that both don't actually address any coherent problem and take the wind out of our sails in terms of making clear the motivation for actually addressing the whole problem. Uh, I just don't see why, why we should bother. So I, when this came up, I, um, I suggested that we should instead fix uh, the, the override mistake uh, instead of making some intrinsics somehow uh, not triggering it. Um, and so basically I, I was against like introducing more exotic behavior in, uh, in intrinsics to, to not trigger the override mistake and have a, a general mechanism to not trigger the overall override mistake that could explain the behavior of intrinsics, of frozen intrinsics, as well as allow um, uh, user code to freeze their, their own classes and instances in a way that doesn't trigger the override mistake. Uh, and and I've talked about this in the past. Oh, this is a good time. Yeah, I just realized this is a good. Uh, probably not everybody. People here who were not at the TC thirty nine meeting uh, might not know about the tremendous opportunity that Shu has given us, which I think Daniel Ehrenberg just mentioned in the chat. Um, yeah, are we talking about Shu's presentation? So let me say a little bit about that because I think there's. This is a tremendous opportunity for us. Um, so Shu, uh, in a similar manner, wanted to introduce what, um, what he called a secure mode. Also, I won't say a similar manner. Uh, Shu actually has, has stated a coherent threat model uh, and he has proposals that um, I think are, are you know, do, are coherent with regard to his coherent threat model. Um, uh, the, I'll, I'll, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll recount all of that in some detail, but let me jump ahead to sort of the, the conclusion that I took from it, um, which is he's raised um, uh, uh, the, he's proposing uh, a set of security mechanisms that include introducing a, explicit new secure mode. And uh, we've shied away from explicitly talking about a new mode, mode switch in the implementation uh, because in particular, we expect that if we had proposed such a th something that, that radical and with that much implementation burden, that Google in particular would be the one to say no. So having Google in particular be the one to propose the mode switch is just a tremendous opportunity. Um, the specific mechanisms that Shu wants to hang off of the mode switch um, do not include fixing the override mistake, but if but one could say that a, a JavaScript realm in secure mode simply didn't suffer from the override mistake. And then some of the things that he's trying to address by other means could be better addressed by simply not being subject to the override mistake. Um, uh, so the Shu's overall threat model, I would characterize as um, you've got inside the realm, no malicious code, but you've got fallible code. You've got code that might be non-maliciously buggy um, uh, in all sorts of you know, sort of plausible, um, uh, you know, plausible ways in which programmers write buggy code. Uh, and you've got malicious data being processed by the fallible, innocent fallible code. And then what he's trying to address is some of the sharp knives by which malicious data can fuse fallible code into uh, causing execution to proceed in a way that gives um, an attacker an opportunity to, to, um, uh, to induce misbehavior in the attacker's interest. And I st I'm stating it in that general term, 
terms first rather than focusing in on the particular misbehaviors that she's talking about, because I want to emphasize that there's a continuum here, which is in general, if the, you know, this is my point, now I'm talking for myself, not for Shu. Uh, in general, when you take a look at the threat model of fallible code, uh, having you know, the programmer writing the fallible code, having made assumptions about what's, what invariants are true of their data, you know, making tacit assumptions, usually inarticulate, um, just kind of you know, assuming it without thinking too hard about it. Uh, and then the malicious data violates those assumptions, causing the execution to proceed in ways that, are, that violate the programmer's assumptions when they wrote the code. Uh, I think that there's no principled limit that you can place on the misbehavior in general that malicious data can induce into fallible code. There's no, um, there, you know, there's no uh, principle that lets you limit that misbehavior to anything less than the misbehavior that malicious code could have engaged in. So that um, you know, a, a system that defends against malicious code um, uh, will defend against the limit of malicious data processed by fallible code. And the, the set of mechanisms that Chu is proposing is not, sim not in aggregate simpler than hardened JavaScript. So we can defend against the stronger threat model, um, defend against the limits of what is coherent, starting with his threat model, and do it for about the same amount of total mechanism and explanation. And so that's why I think there's a tremendous opportunity here. Um, the particular thing that he's focused on is prototype poisoning. He's focused on prototype poisoning because he's assuming that primordials do not get transitively frozen or frozen at all. And the reason he's assuming that primordials don't get frozen at all is he's assuming that, well, two things. One is he's assuming that the uh, override mistake deters people from freezing primordials. And that's better addressed by just getting rid of the override mistake once we have the opportunity of secure mode. Uh, and then the other, um, the other reason is um, compatibility with shims and the need to make a phase distinction between uh, when the shim, shims customize the primordial environment versus when the rest of the application executes. And from what I've seen, I think the phase, that phase boundary exists generally in practical code. Shims that, mo that mutate the primordials are generally pretty specialized. Um, and most good code out there does not mix in that specialization with application logic after the application logic starts running. Uh, and SES, we haven't actually done this yet in the shim, but we architected it so that there is a um, phase between the repair step and the hardening step. Uh, that lockdown is, is actually internally constructed with two phases. The repair step does things like um, uh, put, like uh, prevent any sloppy execution, uh, replace all the evaluators with safe, safe evaluators, um, uh, and a bu bunch of other things, uh, uh, so that you can reason about things using object capability reasoning, but without yet, but without any of the primordials yet being hardened. So that's the phase, and then. Between, so and then, and then in that phase, you run what we've been calling vetted shims, meaning that you're still vulnerable to any misbehavior by the shim because it, it can mutate anything. But then afterwards, after the vetted shim phase, you you do the re, you do the hardening, transit hardening of the primordials, um, and then it's only after that that you load untrusted code into that environment. Um, so I think that uh, deals with shoes. Um, uh, uh, 
um, uh, you know, second reason for thinking people won't freeze the primordials, which is that need to do the shims. Uh, obviously, that's subject to empirical investigation. How much code is it compatible with in practice? But uh, from what I've seen, I think the answer will, will be in our favor. Um, and uh, then there's some further things that, that are part of his proposal, like um, uh, uh, not having navigation to Dunder Proto or to the constructor property, the prototypes dot constructor property uh, happen with a computed property lookup, um, because that's certainly an opportunity for, um, uh, for malicious data to introduce um, uh, property names in the data that are then looked up in a computed manner by code thinking it's just navigating JSON data uh, and in fact navigates to, to built-in stuff. Uh, and for that, um, uh, you know, hardened JavaScript doesn't do much particularly for you. Um, uh, um, so that's so, so that's that's just an inter an interesting thing that I think is kind of orthogonal and and for which Shu's proposal might have something important to contribute. Um, so that, that's my summary of all of that. Um, oh, and then to answer Daniel's question, uh, no, we we actually had not been talking about Shu's proposal. At the beginning, we were talking about this other integrity issue of trying to protect some um, uh, iter some iteration methods on primordials from um, from being replaced for some iteration consumers. And I was arguing that doing that, trying to do any kind of defense there by itself for normal JavaScript, is just not coherent. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't disagree with that. Or I mean. Maybe there's some coherent story behind it, but I haven't heard it. Uh, at the same time, I, I'm, I'm a little. Uh, I'm not sure if I would rate so high the probability that we manage to like shift what she's talking about into getting us into a totally frozen primordial world. Um, I don't know. I. I think Shu's proposal might have made sense kind of at face value. And I'm not sure if she'll be interested in going this way. Well, the uh, he was certainly um, uh, receptive to the idea of starting the conversation and exploring, exploring such a merging of proposals. Uh, yeah, conversations are great. Um, at some point yeah. in the presentation, it sounded like you were saying that uh, it sounded like you were saying like you wouldn't want to see his proposal go ahead if it didn't include this. If it didn't include uh, more SES style things. Yeah, I think that uh, what he's doing is he's, is his proposal without his proposal is introducing a bunch of mechanism that. Um, is only motivated by the assumption that the override mistake remains. Um, and if you fix the override mistake and you can freeze the primordials, then there's other mechanism you just don't need. So I think that his proposal, first of all, I, I don't think there's appetite on the committee for two secure modes. Um, I think we're at most going to get one secure mode. And I think that we have a much more coherent story of, of a secure mode that addresses his threat model as well as ours. Um, and I think, you know, the thing that I began my presentation just now with uh, is a case I'm, you know, I'm, I'm planning to, uh, you know, articulate to him as well and, and to the committee, uh, which is this thing about the, the threat model stated generally, not specific to prototype poisoning, but but innocent foul code being misled by malicious data, the limits on that threat 
are the, the equivalent to the malicious code threat model. I don't think there's a coherent stopping point between the two. I, I don't know. I liked how I liked how she's reasons for prioritizing this area were kind of empirically driven. And also they had kind of a story for why the adoption would be uh, easy, easier. But when you say there is an appetite on committee for multiple secure modes, we I guess in the web, there already are multiple secure modes since we have all these different CSP options. In Chrome, there's trusted types. Um, the CSP options do have plumbing through TC39. I, I kind of worry that I wouldn't want to push this in a direction where they just do something at the web level and like don't even put the plumbing through through the JavaScript specification. Then that would make it more difficult to access like the full in practice definition of the language. And I I, I did not, not I did not understand I did not understand. I mean, we we already have multiple secure modes in the way JavaScript is used. I mean, there's multiple CSP modes, mm -hmm. and this has plumbing through JavaScript. And you know, obviously, uh, strict mode increases security. So I guess I'm kind of wondering what you meant when you say you don't see appetite on the committee for multiple secure modes. Uh, so you say, don't see appetite, don't see appetite from the, who? Um, so one, one of the things that I, maybe, maybe this is, maybe I'm being biased by um, uh, uh, you know, lived experience by, by, by earlier history, but uh, after introducing strict mode into the language, uh, the V8 team in particular, um, uh, just felt like the complexity introduced into the engine of having a having to support two modes, even though strict mode was simpler. From the point of view of users, the fact that they can opt into strict mode and program in a simpler and more well-behaved language is great. But from the point of view of the implementers, they don't get to shed any of the previous complexity. Uh, if you introduce a new mode into the language that changes um, the kinds of, you know, that changes things that the engine needs to do, uh, in, you know, in Shu's case, having to do with, um, with you know, um, uh, computed property navigation, and in our case, having to do with suppressing the override mistake, um, that additional complexity in the language engine that affects execution. And it's historically anything that looked like a new mode switch where the language has multiple modes of execution was something that um, the committee pushed back on very, very hard. Now, it might very well be the case that that's, that's old news that's no longer the case because Having experienced it, uh, generally, we've held back on pushing anything that looks like a mode switch. Um, and the result is that most people on the committee now probably have just never lived through an era where implementers were pushing on it. But the, the, th the thing that, that stands out to me is that Google was the main one saying no more mode switches and now they're saying we want a mode switch and that's so, a big change i think there's a yeah i'm definitely personally sympathetic to the no mode switches argument i think there's a little difference between a mode switch which just prohibits things like if we had this mode that prohibited keyed access of things called prototype or dunder proto um and there's a difference between that and uh, a mode that enables things like the fix to the, the override mistake. I think it's more acceptable for something to be kind of out of band if it's just um, strictly getting rid of things, but it would be more difficult to put the override mistake fix out of band because you may have a JavaScript module that depends on the fix to the override mistake 
and uh, it just gets run in the wrong way, and that messes things up. Uh, as much as I'm sympathetic to fixing the override mistake, and like Bloomberg wants to figure out how to fix it because we sometimes freeze things. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I think I mean I think that's a good empirical question, which is, you know, if there really is differential in engine complexity, and especially if the differential engine complexity results in um, a greater loss I, of confidence in engine integrity, I'm, I'm not even talking about a, engine they, complexity. I'm talking about for for users, uh, if the the like enabling capabilities versus disabling capabilities changes kind of where the where the switch could live uh this this separate from the implementation complexity which uh yeah i i'm not sure so i think I don't, I, I don't think didn't we find that there was exactly one thing which was an old copy of the low dash library that was a thing that would break if you got rid of the override mistake that's the thing we and found yeah even yeah, and that uh, you know we did this empirical investigation of trying to turn, of trying to get rid of the override mistake, and that was the thing that that was the discovery that caused us to back off, and that was for an old copy of Lodash. It was already fixed in the current distributed copy of Lodash, if I recall. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the, that's enough. Back in the matrix chat, um, I did the investigation for the Lodash issue. Um, the Lodash issue isn't actually an issue. It was um, that we were using a counter to figure out if anything hit the override mistake. Lodash trips that counter because it is using the override mistake. However, the function that does it continues to work properly. So it might oh not- Oh my God. I, I said this originally, it might not actually be a web compatibility issue uh, but we don't have a way of automatically detecting it. Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay, that's interesting. Oh. Sounds like we should try further to see if we can figure out how to investigate this further. Because just because that one works doesn't imply that it, it's that's the only thing. Um, I think, yeah, I think it'd be great if we work together to figure out how to how to, how to investigate this. Okay, and and the, you know and the so so the getting so fixing the override mistake would would remove Shu's main reason for skepticism about freezing the primordials, and the remaining you know the the remaining reason was this thing about the phase separation of shims versus application code, and I think uh, uh, I, th I think there's there's you know two. Um, I think first of all, Shu is not aware that CES had the, you know, was built to have the the phase separation between repair and hardening that it does. I think that took him a bit by surprise. Uh, and the other one is that um, just you know our experience of how of you know the incredible amount of code not written to run under CES that actually does run under CES compatibly. We've been very, very pleasantly surprised at the volume of code that is, is of that character. Uh, it's certainly not all code, but it's a tremendous amount of code. And you know, he's, and his presentation, especially the last slide of the presentation, explicitly and now you know, acknowledged that the secure mode would not be compatible with all of JavaScript, that this was a breaking change is just a breaking change that is that that you know he hopes is compatible with a tremendous amount of so, code, and I think our our system is already demonstrating a degree of compatibility with all with tremendous amount of old code that he would find surprising. So I think there are further reasons why it would be more work to convince the Chrome team to. Uh, to go all in on SES for solving this particular kind of problem. Uh, one reason is because they see headers as an easy to deploy way to put in uh, security measures like CSP and trusted types. Uh, such a mode that that she was demonstrating could be enabled by headers. And I think it would not be 
totally inappropriate to do so or like uncomposable or things like that because it's just prohibiting constructs as opposed to enabling things. Um, ACS obviously like is not enabled by headers. I guess maybe it could have a trusted type style API where it says run this code before the lockdown, then run this code afterwards. Uh, that would be possible, but uh, um, I think so this, I, this kind of the, the centralized server-wide or path-wide opt-in mechanism, I think was is a part of, is a factor for them. Okay, so, um, so what you're talking about are specific to web and browsers. Um, you know, TC53 is, has already gone in a CES direction in that the, the, um, you know, the, the, the portable TC53 compliant um, uh, uh, JavaScript for embedded is um, code that, that should, you know, that is supposed to run correctly in a, in a hardened JavaScript environment. And Modbles, of course, has built um, uh, their XS machine so that the, the, the normal configuration for running an embedded is basically a, a, a CES machine, a machine with, without. Um, so the fact that we've got a standards body a virtual machine and and a bunch of, and and several large, um, uh, you know, JavaScript systems, especially you know MetaMask, the main JavaScript wallet, main browser wallet for Ethereum, um, uh, all using uh, CES. Uh, the and that it does address Shu's problem, and it doesn't do it in a way that's specific to the browser. I think these are all sets of powerful arguments and doing both is just more complicated. Now, you know, the, I also, you know, instead of trying to anticipate all the, all of Shu's possible reactions and arguing about what those reactions are, we should just take the conversation to Shu and try to make progress. Uh, what, what if we start with the, this incremental progress towards the, the override mistake thing as opposed to trying to tie it to this other proposal? Uh, sure. I mean, the that incremental progress does not add complexity by virtue of, uh, of not addressing the whole problem. It's a step towards addressing the whole problem that, that borrows no complexity on the way. So I'm all in favor of that. So I think my original idea was assuming we couldn't fix the override mistake, um, just fix it. Uh, and so should we, ex so I think we can't really explore, uh, exploring if we can just fix the override mistake is, uh, is a question more for implementers adding, uh, Adding an experiment, I suppose. Um, so this time I, it was Egalia who did the experiment. I think the implementers would be okay to take external contributions, possibly if we if we do it well and cheaply. But I assume this is something that we need to be able to disable uh, with a uh, experiment fly, right? I mean, it, it it was just it went out through the normal trains for a release and then was stripped out after a couple of releases. Well, there wasn't, I don't think they bothered with an experiment flag, but yeah, that, that could be an extra defense. Okay, I have no idea how that kind of stuff works, to be honest. So um, it's really hard. Uh... Possibility if we come up with a way to implement this check is to run it through what we find in HTTP archive which will be kind of a, um, you know, we we run it we run it on a bunch of websites and see if it triggers, and then we try to include it on browsers only if we really see that it doesn't trigger in those kind of offline tests. 
Um, I I'm not sure what the test would be yet. We we still haven't figured that part out. Yeah, that, that's the part I don't understand. It's um, like if we're talking about like changing the behavior uh, of basically um, what is it? I can never remember a name. That's like ordinary sets with own descriptor. Uh, I, I suppose the the changes in there to to fall back to do a uh, uh, set own instead of uh, a failing, right? Um, so I haven't looked at this in a while, but so if I I don't know how I I don't I who would be able to like lead this effort because that's not me. <laughs> Uh, I can kind of talk someone else through it the way that I did last time, but didn't follow up appropriately last time. I wouldn't be able to do the implementation. Right. And and that's the thing, like, since this is an internal change, I, I don't know how you, how you check that you didn't break anything um, besides getting user reports. So... Maybe for for example, it could be the same kind of counter, but then we check, oh, was it this particular version of Lodash? This is the kind of test that we could run, not embedded in browsers, but if we run it against an archive of websites, um, we could, you know, look at a few versions, see like, oh, okay, yeah, the surrounding code is this exact string, uh, then. I will, and we could include like a bunch of kind of signatures of that, and then yeah, how do you determine one approach? How do you determine that a code fails? So you would just see if the if the trigger that this code path uh, hit was the one that Caitlin already implemented was hit, and if it's not running that particular low dash thing. So we wouldn't check for failure; we check for for coverage. But then omitting the cases that we can identify as it's this particular Lodash thing. So what I understand is that the override mistake in this case, somebody would try to trigger it. And like so that, that's a, that's something actually I don't understand. Like technically, we would be making a failing path into a uh, successful path or or is the problem Lodash another... used it for like a really obscure feature testing kind of reason so it might just not be hit very often it's not a it's not a uh yeah it actually like caught the exception expected to catch it something like that right but is it also the case that if you're running in non-strict mode the assignment would have failed and you would have silently uh, kept executing. And so now the assignment would succeed and you would silently kept exe keep executing, but your object would have different shape than what you uh, what it previously would sure. have. Sure. So that's why the, that's the counter was, is this path hit, not does it fail or something? Sorry, right. But, okay. So that, or, so, so that, that, that issue about the silent divergence uh, is um, a reason to consider uh, what um, uh, bundling a strict only mode with a fixed override mistake mode, which of course uh, uh, it would be another step in the direction of hardened JavaScript. Could we, so would it be possible to, to know which strict mode we're in? When we're uh, when we're doing the ordinary sets, like could we could we only basically could we only trigger this uh, override mistake uh, fix if we're in strict mode? And would that be sufficient? Uh, but we, we don't have enough evidence. We don't have enough evidence that that would be web compatible. 
that's the evidence that we have to collect. But okay. All right. So in in strict mode, this would be purely going from a failing uh, case to a non-failing case, which means unless the code try catches it, try catch uh, and as a try catch check, uh, other code would would have failed in the first place. Yeah, that's exactly what Lodash does. It has a try catch around an invocation of the override mistake. So I think I don't think it's enough to prove to just use that in the air logic. I don't think that's strong enough proof that it would be web compatible. I think we need some some stronger analysis than that. So, so if we if we show that this path is only reached by Lodash and that Lodash passes, that would be one thing. Or maybe we'll find other examples in that analysis, and we can examine those. That's so what I think the next step would be. So what would what would the analysis look like? Basically, we triggered. Uh, we would have triggered the uh, override mistake, and it would have been there's a try catch around it some, somewhere. Like how how do you how do you test for that? So I keep saying the the way we're testing for it is whether it's hit or not this override mistake path so it's a it's not a it's a it's a uh sufficient but not nice i mean it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for proving the web incompatibility so if we find that no one's hitting this at all except for lodash then that would prove that it's probably web compatible but if we do this process we would find other concrete examples that we could look into Okay. So I don't I don't have a solution to this. Like, let's let's find some automated thing that will determine compatibility of everything. No, I don't I don't have that. Just a stronger thing that we could check for. And if that's true, then we've proven our point. My 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 concern is that we'll find other cases uh, of the path that would have been. Uh. Um. We just haven't found those yet. So I feel like finding those would be the next step in the analysis. Okay. How do we and get this to actually happen? This sounds like great investigation. Yeah, I don't know. I'll di I'll discuss it with with others to see if that's something that that we should do, but uh, I can't commit to it right now. I think I have connection issues. Um, yeah, so it's probably not worth exploring uh, alternatives until we have more uh, data on whether fixing the override mistake is possible in the first place. Uh, if it's possible to fix the override mistake without ex explicit opt-in. Yeah, clear clearly, if it is possible to do it without an opt-in, rather than bundling it with the mode, to just have it fixed universally for the language would just be mu much, much better. Um, My alternative suggestion was not automatically bundling with a, a mode, but uh, if, you, if you don't want to tie it to a, to a special mode, uh, it, it would be to have a uh, basically the equivalent of a, a different integrity level, which is like a super freeze, um, which wouldn't trigger uh, the override mistake for objects that have been super frozen. So yeah, yep. and, then, and then yeah, yeah. Then the the freezing step of a lockdown, freezing all the primordials, would obviously make use of that by super freezing the primordials. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, and and harden our harden would also. Um, use super freeze for each step in general, not just for the primordials. And by the way, a side effect of the super freeze that I had in mind uh, would also cache this um, integrity level so that if you do a check like is frozen, 
uh, it doesn't uh, explicitly recheck and trigger all the potential proxy traps uh, on, on the target. Yeah. Um, overall, I, I think if we find that the um, that this thing of um, sorry that it's not web compatible to do the the fix for the override mistake that we should make some other freeze freeze to operation that freezes it but fixes the override mistake at the same time. I think that would be kind of the better than having it be on a global mode switch, even as it's really unfortunate. It seems like a per object property. You wouldn't want it to be like a per chunk of code property because if it's per chunk of code, then you know you're still interacting with things that were come came from other chunks of code. You know, so if it's attached to the data, it should be, you know. With with syntax that that does that as opposed to like anything that's allocated in this file because it was came through with this header, will now have this have this property. I would I would be so first of all I mean have, doing it on super freeze I'd be very happy uh, for that for that solution to happen. Um, uh, if it were simply a realm wide mode switch, uh, that would that would be fine with me as well. Um, but it does mean that it would be. That 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 it affects all code in the realm. Having it be on a per module basis, you know, basically scoped to code rather than objects or realms. Uh, I agree that would be weird. I suppose the way to think about it, if it's per code rather than per data, is that it's a change to the meaning of assignment rather than a change to the meaning of being frozen. Wait, wait, <laughs> I guess there's two different per code things. One is the allocation site triggers which mode it's in. And then the other one is the assignment site. So I was definitely thinking about the allocation site. Anyway, I think we can agree that per well, code is bad uh, and that we okay. the decision tree is either this is part of super freeze or this is part of a realm wide switch. So I so the so I think we're agreed on the conclusion. So I should probably drop it, but I'm just the the thing about the allocation site that works for object literals, but it doesn't work for like calls to object create or any of the million other things in the built-in library that make objects. Uh, indeed, uh, one might ask, why did anybody think that strong mode was vaguely plausible in the first place? Uh, given that it was based on this exact same principle. Um, anyway, that's a tangent. Strong, you're talking about Andreas Rob? Yeah. And Andreas Rob strong mode? Yeah, that was all based on I like, yeah, your strong mode objects are in a different mode if they're allocated in this chunk of code. Very weird okay. proposal. I just, I don't, I, okay, yeah, I don't remember it well enough, but that I agree that sounds pretty weird. All right, well, it looks like we have run this topic to conclusion. Um, thanks everyone.